James and, and Frank did an excellent job in basically introducing in the same problem what I want to do. I want to basically uh, get as accurate solutions to a many body shading equation as possible. And uh, I will probably present a bit of a complementary point of view with respect to the talks in the morning. So just to remind briefly, so I'm considering just the Hamiltonian, which is just non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, uh, with the important part is the interaction between the two particles. Uh, there might be an external potential, but in most of the talks, I will not consider this. So I will really consider a uniform system and extended system so that at the end, I'm interested in the thermodynamic limit. The interaction potential can be chosen phenomenological, for example, kind of Leonard Jones potential to represent liquid helium, which is a test case, which I will show some examples, or more fundamentally, uh, the Coulomb interaction, like in the fundamental easiest system of the electron gas or in liquid solid hydrogen. Uh, the approach is like in the morning, it's variation of Monte Carlo. So the game is to find a wave function uh, in the many body space of the coordinate representation and minimize with respect to some kind of variation of parameters. And if it's extended, then of course, at the end, I'm basically interested most of the time in the energy per particle. And these are kind of finite size corrections, but may indicate something like the gap. Now, <laughs> the whole talk will go about uh, what kind of insight can we have to simply find to form some kind of uh, dry wave functions with maybe contrary to the spirit of machine learning, uh, taking as much information which we have or which we can have in principle, uh, not really very detailed, but very fundamental, like translational invariance, rotational invariance, and so on, and builds this into the wave function. So easily anyone knows uh, what this uh, kind of mean field wave function is just a product wave function if we talk about bosons, so this is automatic symmetrized for Fermi's and anti symmetrized so typically this is a slater determinant made out of some kind of single particle orbitals and then we get our three focus. The first wave function which are somehow putting in explicitly correlations, typically called just row ansatz, but it's like pair product ansatz which actually existed before just row. And, uh, so it is the first variation on Monte Carlo calculation for helium was performed with this answer from Macmillan. And since then it's somehow a standard form where you start for Monte Carlo calculations. And to stimulate fermions, one have to put in anti-symmetry. So one has to anti-symmetrize putting in a slater determinant, for example. And that was for the first time shown that it's possible to by David, who might be still here. Now, what are the guidelines for the trial wave function now? Of course, I can rewrite just the logarithm of the wave function, which should be somehow positive if it's the ground state, and just write it as a kind of a functional expression over the density operator. Uh, and then I have the single particle term, and then I have these two particle terms, and then uh, one might go on this kind of expression, of course. Now the parameters are hidden here in this kind of functions, but of course they depend on density. Now if the density is non-uniform, then it's a kind of a functional dependence, which is mean density. Of course, if it's uniform, then the mean density is somehow constant, so it makes things easier in some sense, but maybe more difficult in other sense. The problem is all of this is how to go beyond this answer. And so how to build in, of course, the next thing, three body correlation. And three body correlations, if I write it like this with three densities, that to be ugly because this kind of function has somehow too many variables for me. And so uh, 
you might think about of representing this, but it's kind of uh, proved to be maybe not so difficult, but one can do better. Of course, going beyond, you might think of other things, gradient terms and so on. So the job is what I want to, to, to tell in the process, just so what kind of insight we have to really represent better this kind of general approach. Now, in the history of in the talk, in the title of the talk, I indicate already uh, my favorite thing is backflow <laughs> to, to use to improve wave functions. So that was introduced historically by Feynman to actually describe excitation spectrum of liquid helium, so the famous phonon roton spectrum. And actually, it's if you want to have an external atom, for example, you put it in some kind of a flux then hydrodynamic considerations will say that there should be kind of a backflow uh, reacting the liquid due to the disturbance of the flux of this atom. And so the backflow has some kind of characteristic asymptotic form at long distances, such as somehow same kind of momentum dot the distance and so you can put this here together and build instead of the coordinate an ansatz which is the same plane wave but with backflow coordinates, such a kind of dress coordinate. Now, later, this was kind of, uh, I guess it was around Pandaripande who noticed that uh, one can use this wave function to describe just normal Fermi liquids because in some sense, what one puts into the orbitals of the Slater determinant are excitations, uh, which are just plane wave states up to Kf. And so this kind of excitation one puts in, why not to put in uh, backflow effects? And one can argue that this captures some kind of momentum correlation. And that proved to be a pretty universal way uh, uh, to go beyond Slater just to results and was shown that it worked for liquid normal helium, uh, helium-3. It worked for the homogeneous electron gas. It worked if you take a two-component system and you consider protons and electrons, you have liquid or solid hydrogen, and also for atoms, molecules, solids, basically kind of the same form always gives you some noticeable improvement in the, in the energies. But of course, this is just backflow a little bit heuristically explicated. It's possible to give it a bit more systematic way also to go beyond. So one scheme is uh, to think about this uh, is to look at the feynman cax formula, which basically says if you start with a trial wave function and you build some uh, random walk drifted by this trial wave function, and you weight this random walk with the local energy, which is just you apply the Schrodinger, the Hamiltonian on the wave function and you divide by the wave function. Uh, then you get a better wave function and for large enough time, you should asymptotically converge up to a constant to your ground state. So if you now look uh, at this local energy and you write it in terms of this kind of logarithm of the, the trial wave function, you actually get three terms. You get your potential energy, which is a two-party term. You get the Laplacian of a two-party term, it's a two-party term. And you get the gradient of a two-party term squared. And this is actually a three-body term. So you can get out what kind of, and it's a particular three-body term because it's not combining arbitrary three particles, but it's combining them over the gradient of a two-particle term. So it's much simpler. And so you can use this to systematically improve and put this, if you have a trial wave function, you put this just in the logarithm of your trial wave function to put, to get a better one. Uh, and so if you play this game on the first level and you start with a Slater just for wave function, you plug this in and just that you get a three body term. Of course, there's somewhere hidden the determinant and what you get as a kind of a leading order firm is actually a backflow three body term. Uh, so you can actually argue that from this kind of local energy method, you get uh, uh, an improvement 
uh, in a sense of what is the functional term you should put in, uh, in things that your three body term is actually a two body term, a gradient of a two body term, which looks like this, actually squared. Uh, and, here. <coughs> and so you can, of course, now try to go on and go further. <laughs> Now you have to keep a little bit track and you have to think about if it's calculable if you do it. So we have seen here the most generous three body term is kind of actually because it depends on two uh, vectors actually of two distances, but the local energy method just shows you that actually it's probably you capture most of the effects by taking two vectors uh, where you sum over here j before and k before. And you put some of the scalar product, uh, you, you treat this as vectors. Uh, so you see now, if you if you just build in general tensor vector forms, and you always these forms of new one dimensional functions, which one eventually will optimize. Uh, but then one can very easily uh, construct n body correlations by just how you build scalars out of tensors and, and and vectors. And you can also make n body backflow. And so this is a scheme where you can easily automatize to build in many body correlations. It's actually very straightforward to build out uh, the derivatives you need for the local energy. It's just the chain rule for the for derivatives and also the optimization is pretty straightforward. As uh, a computational cost of calculating, it's just like the cost of calculating this 1D function, so it's essentially the same. And so this is one way how we can improve wave functions and it actually works. Now, can one go further? Okay, so first we go further. That was all for the uniform system. Now going to the strongly inhomogeneous system, one has to pay a little bit more attention. Uh, and actually when calculating the backflow, uh, one can argue that it's not really the argument of the wave function what should change for a strongly inhomogeneous system like atoms, but it's the orbital itself, uh, which is kind of similar what before was introduced uh, in the lattice version of backflow. Federico and, and Sandro talk about that. And actually by doing this for for for, for atoms in continuous space. Uh, with only a handful parameters, uh, variational parameters, one actually gets uh, with a single particle, single determinant wave function, uh, very reasonable competitive uh, energies in the fraction of the correlation energy. And when going to diffusion Monte Carlo, uh, one, one basically competes with all kinds of different sorts of uh, single determinant wave functions. You put more determinants, you can improve Now, is it a way to go further even? Uh, this is just the title of, of my talk, I was talking about iterative improvements of backflow. And so, uh, yes, there is, <laughs> otherwise I would not have chosen the title. Uh, how to, uh, if you, Difficult in a different scheme, not the local energy scheme, but in a different scheme, you think about that you would write down your basis space, for example, uh, a slater determinant. Uh, so you have different slater determinants, and then you look at the hat matrix element for your Hamiltonian. Now, if you want to go to the ground state, you basically, of course, if you can do it exactly in CI, you diagonalize your Hamiltonian. If you cannot do that exactly, you might try to do a, a kind of canonical transformation because uh, if you only go for the ground state, there's no I, but we can approximately diagonalize the Hamiltonian and put in an operator, a many body operator here uh, to do this. So if one does this again, uh, which, uh, if you do it for the electron gas or for two component system, it essentially comes back to the uh, collective excitation approach to from, from Bowman and Pines a long time ago. 
then you end up as a first order effect uh, that you get a just row uh, function as just return, which basically uh, describes you effectively two particle collision and in particular the collective plasmon effect uh, of charge systems and of phonons from neutron neutrons. And the backflow you get also out of this uh, transformation effectively takes care about weak momentum dependence and, and plasmon electron interaction. So now once you do this game, of course you can do this game again. Uh, so you can just start with this kind of first order wave function uh, and play the same game. Can you find a transformation? Now the form is pretty much the same. So the structure you will get, uh, just the structure, uh, will be pretty much the same. Uh, you will get again a new just row and you get a backflow. But this time the new just row will basically build out of the arguments which are in the first order uh, orbitals, which are just the backflow. Uh, so you see a structure that you get uh, a new backflow coordinates, which are built out the old backflow coordinates and you build a new just row built out the old. So, so now, you clearly see that there's a kind of an iterative procedure uh, which you hope which will stop at some point. And for example, if you have the structure, it puts forward that there should be a kind of Fermi liquid wave function essentially describing the system. Uh, so since it's of course something a uh, uh, workshop is machine learning, so I tend to abuse the language, which I don't really know very well. Uh, and would say that this is kind of uh, describing a network uh, because you basically iteratively start with uh, some input variable, which are your bare coordinates. You put in new hidden variables, which are basically kind of backflow coordinates. And then you can put no new hidden layers based on this old coordinates and at each layer you can put in uh, new just row functions which depends on these coordinates of this layer and so you can basically get a kind of a network structure to describe the whole function. As a kind of a different uh, uh, relation, in particular, if you consider bosonic systems, uh, you can think about you get the same structure by doing a, a projection in imaginary time. Uh, if you take the propagator, which is basically e to the minus tau h, uh, and you apply it to a wave function, you always know you get a better wave function uh, in the sense that if you apply this sufficiently often uh, with small tau uh, in a kind of a convolution, you get uh, a large imaginary time. I'm sorry. And at large imaginary time, the propagator just filters out the ground state. And so you event exponentially converge to your ground state. Now, if you look at the structure in continuous space, uh, in a sense, you can think about that this gives you uh, a network where you start with some input variables. Uh, you, you couple them to a new layer, which is uh, the coupling is just Gaussian. And then you have the interaction working on one layer and you couple again to a new layer and you get basically an exponential conversion to your ground state. Now. Uh, of course, this is pass integral Monte Carlo. You do the uh, variation of pass integral Monte Carlo. You basically do explicitly the integration by Monte Carlo uh, integration. Now, can one go further and do the integration analytically? That would be great. Uh, then you would exactly get an exact representation you can do. So you cannot do this analytically exactly, but you can do this approximately. Uh, you can basically uh, integrate, expand. If you start with a 
Castro function. Uh, you have a Gaussian kernel and you integrate this kind of Castro potential with some kind of a Gaussian uh, to new coordinates coupled by lambda and lambda is a big number for small tau. Uh, so it basically means that the coordinates here will be closed to the old one. And, but instead of expanding close to each other, let us expand at an arbitrary point Q. Uh, you do this expansion, you stop after the first order and you put this into the Gaussian integration. Uh, and now what is the optimal point to expand? The optimal point is just that the Gaussian in the mean is centered around zero, so there's no drift. Uh, and this, now if we do this, uh, you write out the wave function, you obtain uh, the functional form here for bosons. It's just the functional form of a two-body interaction. And then you get a two-body interaction, but this is new coordinates, which are implicitly determined by this equation, where the drift is just zero. So this equation is nothing else, or which has the form of our good old vector form. Uh, and so, if you think about that, you do this iteration approximately analytically, you get back the backflow network I was talking before. Uh, so it somehow heuristically uh, hints that if the potential, the problem you're considering is, is sufficiently smooth, then this network will eventually approach you the exact wave function exponentially. Now, the bad thing is usually you're more interested in fermionic systems and fermionic systems, uh, this kind of uh, expansion breaks down because they're not any more smooth enough if you consider a determinant, uh, which is going from exponentially large numbers to zero at some point. Anyhow, one can nevertheless do this and now uh, the only thing which count is not the heuristics or the explanation, but basically what are the results. So uh, here we tested it for bosonic systems. And so this has different uh, layers, iterations in the backflow. And for bosonic systems, we know the exact results by diffusion of us into Monte Carlo. And so basically you pretty fast converge to the uh, right energies at different densities. So this is here for helium, liquid helium. Uh, nicer even is that there's a transition from liquid to solid helium uh, freezing at some kind of densities, at higher densities. And so our backflow network basically does not lose the precision going from liquid to solid and it's able without external triggering to, uh, to get the transition right. It's quite rightly liquid and a solid phase in both things. Uh, we have further made tests uh, for charged bosons in an external harmonic trap and some benchmarks for thermionic systems uh, with helium-3. Now, I will enter a little bit because the fermionic systems are this which we are really interested in. So the first kind of test was in two dimensions uh, for helium three non-polarized and polarized to look at the ground state. So again, you start on this slate adjust row, you get one backflow iteration and then you get more backflow iterations. And typically what needs, seems to be good is to extrapolate them against the variance at some point when you see some kind of a linear behavior and one would expect that uh, zero, the linear extrapolation to zero variance would coincide with the exact result. Now in this case for small systems, 20 atoms, 26. So one can do transient estimate calculations uh, where one just keeps the sign. And of course the arrow bar is much bigger, but here the arrow bar is controllable and the extrapolation seems to be rather good, uh, good to coincide uh, on the scale at least uh, with the result in transient estimates. So one indeed seems to converge pretty close to the ground state. Uh, the computational cost of the iteration increases slightly, but not dramatically. 
for each iteration. So, uh, and, and of course, the number of parameters you consider is a different scale compared to the two talks in the morning. It's basically a, something like 10 to 15 parameters at each layer. So you can basically hope that one gains more by increasing the amount of magnitude kind of parameters. Um, now, a second important issue is this kind of wave function size consistent. Uh, so the derivation somehow indicates that the backflow wave function should be size consistent, but it's, it's nice to see that. And so actually when we do a 58 atoms, basically see a kind of a similar gain in energies on the BMC and BMC level. Uh, the only problem is we don't know the exact result anymore because for the transient estimate, it's just far off uh, to get this converge number of particles, a factor of two and the exponent and all kills the sun. That's the side point. <coughs> uh, more, so up to now it's basically kind of benchmarks. So recently we used the wave function to consider a physical question, the question of in the electron gas, uh, if there is a phase where iterative magnetism could be present through the electron gas. So one expects basically that in the electron gas, the uh, typical density parameter is Rs, which is more like as the inverse uh, sort power of, uh, of the density. So high densities are smaller s and low densities are larger s. There's a Wigner crystal transition it's somehow at the 100 Rs, which is very, very low densities, and the metallic densities are at one to five. And typically one might expect from approximate calculations that there is a polarization transition happening close to weaker transition. Now, uh, our wave function, if we do the iterative improvement with the backflow, again, if we have a variance extrapolation for various iterations, seems to be pretty reliable. We can do this for, uh, zero polarization, full polarization, and intermediate also. And basically what we see is that uh, the unpolarized phase is basically always star stable up to the point where Wigner crystallization sets in. Uh, so actually, so from this kind of result, we are pretty confident that actually the, The most fundamental model where you would see this kind of stoner polarization transition, uh, the homogeneous electron gas, actually, uh, many body correlations and, and more precise ground state suppresses this kind of polarization transition. So now I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, so basically, what I wanted to show is somehow that how one can obtain some information. Uh, of how to build wave functions so that one have a systematic improvement of the many body wave functions. So now here I focus basically all the examples were not many parameters. The experience was usually, if there is an improvement, one sees that with the right functional form for very few parameters, of course, then one avoids also the problem of optimization, large set of parameters, but of course it would be nice to think about how to exports this to much more parameters and a few orders of magnitude more. Uh, so I, I showed basically two ways how to put it in. One can put such many body potentials somehow from this kind of backflow vector tensor potential and for more inhomogeneous system one should basically use a kind of an orbital backflow. And and what is very efficient is this kind of nonlinear backflow iteration, which is uh, a bit reminding of kind of a deep network to fit in this. Of course, uh, uh, it's a bit of a pity that we cannot be there and physically discuss. I would have many questions of really what are really exactly the relation with neural network states and what would be a method maybe to uh, combine this kind of, of wave functions. Uh, of course, there's always a question what to do with this, of course, to, to, to address. Uh, and here I'm addressing basically 
thermodynamic limit problems uh, get somehow better wave functions for fermionic problem. Uh, a different issue would of course be to use this uh, to attack this variation on Monte Carlo as a time dependent problem in continuous systems. So we started this with Giuseppe a few years ago on 1D, but of course it would be nice to go on to 2 and 3D dimensions. Okay, so with that, I think basically my collaborators, Sikiliuchi and Saverio Mohoni, more recent and before uh, long time collaborators, actually, who introduced me to backflow David and Carlo uh, 